We had 10,000 people that were out of work overnight. And so even if we, and it, we were able to somehow magically restore their homes, which we started very early in the process, they would be without a job. Uh, they would be without schools. Uh, so we had to look at it from a global standpoint. And we think that $500 million is very um, uh, creative. Uh, in uh, from an economic development standpoint because it's just not the footprint of the port. That is the port of the Mississippi's. Mississippi's Port of the Future, the largest economic development project in the state's history, has raised many social and environmental issues. That's why the community is asking, is the plan for the Port of the Future above board? The first issue the community questioned was the diversion of housing funds for an expansive port restoration. When we learned that the port was going to divert uh, $600 million from housing to the port. The Steps Coalition launched People Before Ports, and my organization was one of many that joined that effort. When Governor Barber went to Washington and was fighting for money from the federal government for South Mississippi to help us recover, call it what you will, he went to Washington to get money to help us. Um, you can go back and look at his testimony, you can go back and look at the submissions, go back and look at what he told Congress. There were three projects for which we did not request funding last fall. First is the rebuilding and redevelopment of the Port of Gulfport. He told Congress he wanted this money, this five or six hundred million, to spend to restore the port, to, to bring these jobs and to help our economy recover. He got the money from Congress. I don't see that as a diversion from housing. Instead, Congress gave Barber $423 million, part of which had to be spent on affordable rental housing. In September 2007, Barber informed the Department of Housing and Urban Development that he would be redirecting $600 million from Phase 1 of the Homeowners Assistance Grant Program to the Port Restoration. In a January 2008 letter to Barber, HUD Secretary Alfonso Jackson stated, I remain concerned that this expansion does indeed divert emergency federal funding from other more pressing recovery needs, most notably affordable housing. The letter to, uh, to the governor of Mississippi was troubling to me, especially when you go on to say you're concerned that there may be significant unmet needs of affordable housing, which I agree with, but I'd like to know what is it that you think that is unmet in the, in the region? Well, I, I don't think that everything has been provided to low and moderate income people that should be provided for housing or infrastructure. So I totally agree with you, but had I had my, um, my um, druthers, I, would, I probably would have said, sir, I don't think we should be using this money and I would not approve it, but I didn't have that kind of authority. The Port of the Future continued to draw nationwide criticism. 2008 also marked the year a complaint was filed against HUD for allegedly violating federal funding guidelines. It was also the year the global engineering giant CH2M Hill received a $35 million contract to design and manage the port project. In 2009, the STEPS Coalition then launched Partners for a Safe and Healthy Port campaign by hosting informational meetings in affected areas. One you know, legitimate complaint that the STEPS Coalition and its partners have had for a long time is the lack of transparency, the lack of information coming to the community so that the community can even make informed decisions, can do informed advocacy. They're not opposed to progress, uh, quote unquote. They're opposed to squandering and wasting money and, and to putting money into a project that's not being well managed. In 2010, the parties in the case settled, and $132 million was reallocated back to housing rehabilitation. Over the past five years, as our state has grappled with restoring all that was damaged by Hurricane Katrina, a series of conflicts emerged over priorities in the use of federal disaster recovery funds. One of the major conflicts developed into a lawsuit against the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for approving Mississippi's redirection of housing funds to expand the state port of Gulfport. We have agreed to dedicate $93 million to this program. We have told the Secretary that we will meet any need above that 
out of the money that he has allocated or reallocated to the port project. Finally, in December 2011, Partners for a Safe and Healthy Port campaign was formalized as the Port Campaign Coalition with key community stakeholders. We represent the, the community at large. There are a number of us who represent different com communities, not just North Gulf Port, but Villa Del Rey, Emerald Pines, Forest Heights, you know, Sar City. I support and I also um, tell the people in the Surry City community that we need to support each other because all of the African American communities in Gulfport at one way or another are connected and affected in many, many different ways. You had um, outsiders, a lot of speculators coming in, buying the land cheap and selling it back to the residents at an enormous price. So we decided that um, we could buy our own land and basically build permanently affordable homes for the residents in North Gulfport. Eight years after Katrina, the physical signs of hurricane damage are diminishing. However, four years and over $100 million into the port restoration, a man-made storm of controversy continues to rage over the management of the project. It, it seems to us candidly that the Mississippi Center for Justice and the STEPS Coalition seem to have only one thing in mind, and that is blocking the project at every turn. I just want to just say one more time that the STEPS Coalition is not against the port. We want to see jobs created in our community. We want to see all the things that I just spoke about, a safe and healthy port, a safe and healthy community. On, on numerous occasions, the port has attempted to engage STEPS and its representatives other, and, and, and other community special interest groups, but we're rebuffed. We've asked on numerous times to meet with the port, to meet with MDA, to meet with the uh, Department of Transportation, and all of those uh, agencies that have some say in how this thing rolls out. And it is not just the STEPS coalition that has become impatient and disenchanted with the port. You see it across the business community. You see it all across local elected officials and state elected officials. Everybody except the Port Authority, it appears, is dissatisfied with its performance. This dissatisfaction emanates from five interconnected components. First, confusing and constantly changing job numbers, and the question of rebuilding the poultry freezers. Secondly, health and environment, and how a port connector road and inland port could negatively impact surrounding communities. Then there's the question of elevation as it pertains to emergency evacuation. What about the deepening of the channel? And of course, community involvement, which takes into consideration the voice of the people. It, it was a number, it was health issues, it was environmental justice issues, it was um, jobs that uh, motivated us to continue and be tenacious about this campaign. People on the coast will have a lot more jobs in the first 10 years or less. There'll be about 6,500 new jobs here on the port and about another 10,000 indirect and induced jobs down here. We have to meet the national objective of 51% of the jobs being offered to low to moderate income individuals. We have that requirement in all of our contracts with all of our existing tenants and with all of our construction contractors. We want promises that our men will have jobs. We want promises fulfilled, not promises that change with the wind. Because y'all said that we were going to get jobs. And 300 jobs is not enough. One person in our neighborhood training is not enough. And I'm very concerned. Out of 20,000 in my district, I'm sure you can find a job for at least 125. This is the largest economic development project in the history of the state of Mississippi. And as an economic development project, the goal is jobs, job creation. Um, that goal has never changed. There's been a lot of questions about how many jobs, what kind of jobs, but the fact is, is it's always been about jobs. It's about jobs and it's about wages, and that's what we represent. 
3,200 direct and indirect jobs before the storm. If you get me through my next five years of recovery, I'm going to take that up to clo close to 5,000 very well-paying jobs and get me through my 10-year vision, and I'll get it up to over 5,000. I just did not see that. I didn't feel that uh, the port director at that time was moving as quickly to make sure that we got 1,200 additional jobs. My entire thought process was, this was going to be created for the purpose of putting those individuals back to work within that community, primarily low uh, to moderate income. When the port officially came out and said, those numbers that we've said in the past have changed from large numbers, 5,000, down to just what it will take for us to be compliant with HUD, 1,200 jobs. I felt like I'd been kicked. We have not even gotten back to the pre-Katrina level of jobs now. They are talking about creating maybe 1,200 jobs. For $600 million, that is not good math. There is a lack of confidence in those in charge coming from the port. And the community don't trust what's being said to them. Just like I've been telling you for the longest about we only have 60, 50 to 60 longshoremen working on a day-to-day -day basis. And you put in the paper, the poor did, 383. Where did we get the number? That's, that's right. And you know what? And that's not correct. And we talked about it yesterday. Well, I'm not going to fuss about it, but I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. We talked about that yesterday. You know where I got that number? Or where we got that number? Where? From your union. If it's wrong, and, and, we go into your union. And, 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 Shortly after this interaction, new executive director Jonathan Daniels announced at a port meeting, the port does employ the equivalent of 103 full-time longshoremen, not the 388 union workers as previously publicized. However, the issue of the once successful poultry industry, which did employ many more longshoremen, looms over the restoration project. The first freezer that was ever built in this port was built in 1972. Between 1990 and the year 2000, we loaded 331 ships of poultry. That was slightly less than 2,500,000 tons, but in a good year, we were generating 200,000 man hours. And one week we hear that the freezers are going to come back. Then we hear that they're not going to come. Then we hear that there's no market for the chickens leaving the port and Gulfport. So we, we really don't know exactly what to believe and what not to believe. What makes you think that in two years we're told that they're going to put the chicken freezers back in 2015? Why would anybody give up the chicken business so you could get it back? Just a little common sense is needed here. I've been one of the supporters of the chicken freezer all along. There are, there, there are serious economic questions about whether or not it's profitable. Um, I, I don't really care. I think it's a public facility we build and then we go fight for the business and we fight for the traffic and, and we, we build that publicly owned facility to accommodate those jobs in that industry. and, and if it doesn't make money for a few years, well, that's okay. I'd just like to know why don't we have the chicken business back? Because a lot of the people that lived in this community worked at it. Prior to Hurricane Katrina, our chicken, the volume, had been declining anyway. He was doing four or five ships, sometimes a week, so it was not declining. Also, they had insurance proceeds from the freezer after the storm. Am I correct? Something like $25 million. Is yeah, that true? That's correct. that's correct. And I know they could have took that $25 million and built a temporary freezer, and we would have kept that business with Tyson, Sanderson's and Farm, and everybody else. Right now we're at a, a piece of property that is uh, owned by Hancock Bank and this is where the port plans to put their inland port facility. The community has a lot of concerns about this. That it is a contaminated site, that it was a fertilized factory and that it has not been cleaned up and that there is a tremendous amount of lead and arsenic 
that's migrating northwest and that is near my community. Um, there's some use for that property somewhere. Now some of it is going to be wetlands forever, probably most of it. Um, there's some of it that is still in environmental re remediation It's not going to be used at all. There's some of it that's fine. Why would you come in uh, a predominant poor low-income neighborhood and, and, and want to build a White House and store containers when you got all that land out there on 605, you got all that land over there on Mange Avenue, you got all that land on the fairground road. I mean, there's land everywhere. Right here is a large rail yard that just happens to be adjacent to this. One thing the port will not admit and the community is very concerned about is they're going to expand this rail yard into this and make this an intermodal facility where you have rail and truck located together. So that has even more effects on the community. And we're all concerned for the health of our community, our kids, and noise pollution. What's to say you're not going to go up there and load those trucks up so they can get a fast start the next day, refrigeration running, and we got to listen to that stuff at night when we're trying to sleep. That's not good. There's a use for that property that, that, that everybody can live with. We just need to talk until we find out what that use is. The National Resources Defense Council's article titled Harboring Pollution, Strategies to Clean Up U.S. Ports, says marine ports of the United States are major hubs of economic activity and major sources of pollution. The quality of life is going to tremendously affect us. We have people that already have cancer respiratory system. And then you look at our young ones now that has asthma. So that's gonna increase the problem with their health. When you think about um, the children that attend the 28th Street Elementary School, and with the Port Connector Road is coming within 500 feet of the, the school, when those kids finish high school, when they graduate, they go to college, and they become ill. It would be a direct result from these kids breathing diesel emissions from these thousands of trucks that would be going through the community every day, 24 hours a day. But just not to talk about it or just to ignore our cry or to say we got some readings and they're not what you say they are, when you're getting readings from everywhere in a Gulfport except the location of the road. And probably their greatest concern, although there's many, but their greatest concern that as the road travels from this property to the interstate, it's going through virgin wetlands. And by going through virgin wetlands and filling in virgin wetlands, the water that used to go to those wetlands during hurricanes and storms and rain now will go to their houses and they will flood. The water that flows or doesn't flow or is not stored in the wetlands is, is a component of the environmental justice issue. So what's done to that floodplain of that small creek has got a lot of impact on people's yards, what backs up into their houses, and how their drainage continues to work. But we never address the wetlands about it. We've never addressed how we're going to have 24-hour day payloads in a community. This thing is a ridiculous position from day one and always have been and still is today. So I would ask the gentlelady, again, recognizing your concerns in that area, bring a motion, bring what you want, but today I would ask that you consider that our vote is from 28th Street South and asking that the Port Commission make it official that they ask MDOT to service them at the area they'd like to be serviced at, and that being 30th Avenue. Thank you. Until we receive an environmental from the Port about moving it to 30th, and we're certainly, we're open to all communications and doing what's necessary and what's best for the people of, of the coast and Gulf Look, this is our Gulf Coast. This is our environment. The last thing in the world we want to do is pollute the air, pollute the water, um, uh, cause an environment where um, children would not have, again, that quality of life that we, that we dream for for all our children. And so we said, let us try to work together. Certainly, there are uh, ways that we can reach uh, solutions. Hurricane Katrina brought a storm surge of nearly 30 feet along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. The port and surrounding communities were not prepared. 
Hence the question of port elevation. How high is safe enough during an emergency? And what about the cost? In March 2012, WC4 Trucking was awarded a $19 million contract to elevate the West Pier to 25 feet. The 25 is the best investment the port can make. I do believe that, because we won't have to rebuild the port every 10 years. We would like to see the elevation of the port go at least four or five feet to protect us from the Isaacs and the Gustav. But we were told that even if we don't mandate an evacuation, you're going to go anyway, voluntarily. That's your practice based on your insurance underwriting guidelines. Even if you were at 25 feet and you had a Katrina out there, you would evacuate. So it was argued, why spend the money to go to 25 feet when no matter what, they're going to move anyway? I'm a little bit confused why CH2 Hill was at 25 two years ago and now they're at a 10 and we've done wasted on CH2 Hill 16 million dollars plus all of the others we've wasted. We've probably done spent 60, 70 million dollars and we're still uh, arguing about an elevation. We understand again you don't have to raise the west side of the port to 25 feet to be able to protect those communities. Uh, that is something that, again, uh, scientifically has never been a demand of FEMA uh, or HUD or anyone else. Increased commerce from the completed Panama Canal expansion in 2015 was Governor Barber's initial plan for the port of the future. With the, with the, the new Panama Canal, expanded Panama Canal, opened in 2015 and 16, you're going to see many, many more container-carried maritime freight cargoes that come into the Gulf. A foreign trade ambassador from China, from the Chinese government, wanted to meet. This individual explained to me that uh, they were very interested in bringing the freight that they use for the eastern half of the United States to the port of Gulfport. That's enormous. However, more jobs for a busier port of Gulfport hinges on a deeper shipping channel. And the most important scenario involves deepening the channel. As I understand it, there is no request right now to deepen the channel at the, from the port to the core. With the Corps of Engineer Mobile Office, we suspended the, uh, not recon, but the uh, cost-benefit analysis because, because there's so many unanswers. It was a cost-benefit, okay. CB, yeah. I was stunned when I learned that they would not deepen the channel that they had not even submitted the application for to the Corps of Engineers. How many of you all remember when the port of the future uh, was rolled out for all of us to hear about? Welcome to the Mississippi State Port at Gulfport, where the port of the future is taking shape. How many of you all remember hearing that we are going to build a port that's going to surpass the port of Los Angeles and contain a cargo yes. vessel. Yes. And how is that cargo going to come in here? It's going to come in here on vessels coming through an expanded Panama Canal. In order to have a port of the future, you should have considered dredging seven years ago. You know, I heard that if they dredge now, it'll take 10 years. But the seven years have passed and had nobody done anything. But before, when all this money was coming about, it was all about a mega port. Now we hear different things. We don't know what to expect coming from you all. There, there's no way we, we're going to be a, an L.A., uh, the kind of ports that you see on the West Coast. There's just, it's not possible. And I, I, I don't know who presented that, but I haven't presented that in the last three years. Well, that's what the port said at first. It was based on the expansion of the Panama Canal and the deepening and the widening of the, the port of Gulfport. But we can't abandon the responsibility that we have, I think, to try to uh, work as we might to deepen uh, that port to be able to get more customers in there and create more jobs. If the people that are in that community aren't at the table when those when those conversations start, then a mistake has been made. And that's a big problem. It's like leaving us out of the loop and you're going on making decisions as to what you're going to do and come through our community. Well, if their ears are open and their hearts are not, the only thing you can do 
And for me, the only thing I can do is pray and continue the fight. And they will feel the wrath of the people in North Gulfport and in these low-income communities because we're making our voices heard. People sometimes in the governor's office, sometimes members of local governments, definitely a lot of people down at the port, they don't see anything unjust. The elected officials within that community must be sitting at the table. Tell us if you're gonna have jobs. Tell us how many jobs are gonna come. Tell us the facts about the, the freezer. Tell us the facts about the deepening of the channel. We want to see the port be successful, and we also want to see the community preserved, and those things can happen together. The voice of the people being heard means engaging more than just a few people over and over again. It's given everybody an opportunity to be involved. Well, what is positively always going to happen is the people who were not included in those conversations are going to say, well, what about us? We have good attorneys. We will take their own rules and regulations and fight them and we will win. If we can have more regular conversations and meetings with those people, even when there's not a, an agenda that we have to accomplish, sit down and let's talk. And so I feel good. I think we've turned the corner. Uh, not trying to be critical of where we were at, but it was not, it's not headed in the direction that we wanted. Uh, we weren't working fast enough. We were making some decisions that I don't think had been uh, had supported uh, by a, 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 a real plan for the future. And now we're headed in the right direction. New leadership, uh, a decisive, aggressive new plan for the future, a working relationship with the people of that community, uh, and a determination to get this done for the quality of the life of the people in Harrison County on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and to let all the world know that we've got a port that's open and ready for business. And I, I would hope that would be the feeling of people on this Gulf Coast. That we would care enough for each other. That we would want the best for each other.